Jones, who's going to speak on the, I suppose, mainly related to the last two areas of, of our um, focus. So um, as you can see the title of her lecture, she's going to introduce that. But I'd like to introduce Kate, um, who's a leading music therapist running um, music therapy service in Lambeth. And she trained at Roehampton University, has been working as a music therapist for 23 years, and it's called um, Music Therapy Lambeth, the charity that she directs, and was founded 14 years ago. Um, I'm particularly pleased to welcome Kate because she and I worked together while she was um, undertaking this research at Anglia Ruskin, and I was on the supervisory team. And we've been working together, um, hoping to do some further work. And she's going to be publishing some of this work as well. Um, and I think that the transformative effects of music really come over in this research um, for this particular client group. And it's very new work. Although many people work in this field, we, there isn't a lot of research, as Kate will tell us, um, but she's developing that. So welcome to you, Kate. It's really lovely to see you again. And thanks for coming back, if not virtually. I know it's virtual, but um, to give to give this presentation. So we'll invite Kate to present for about 45 minutes and then we'll have about 10 to 15 minutes of question and answer. As Sarah said, she'll coordinate that through the Q&A. So over to you, Kate, and a very warm welcome. Thank you so much, Helen, for the warm introduction there. So I'm really delighted to be here this evening as actually um, October is also Selective Mutism Awareness Month. And um, so it's really apt to be presenting at this time. I'm just gonna go on to share screen now so you can see the beginning of the presentation. Okay, I hope you can all see that. Okay, so the title of this presentation is my P the title of my PhD, which is Evaluating a Theoretical Framework for the Use of Music Therapy in the Treatment of Selective Mutism in Young Children, a Multiple Case Study. And I undertook this at Anglia Ruskin University with Helen O'Dell Miller as my first supervisor and Amelia Oldfield as my second supervisor. I also had funding from the music therapy charity towards the case study aspect of the research. So in tonight's webinar, um, I'd like to sort of talk about the motivation behind the research and also discuss what is and what isn't selective mutism. I'll give an overview to the whole project, um, including sort of dipping into current treatments for selective mutism, um, the literature around music therapy and selective mutism, the survey and the interviews that were part of the project and the analysis method but then I'll go on to really focus on the multiple case study research, which is the main part of the PhD. And I'm, I'll talk about a particularly complex case study because this is very rich in data and I will be including some case material. So if you could um, not record the lecture or take photographs of it, I'd, I'd appreciate that. And we can send out slides afterwards. I think there might be an alternate recording of the, of the lecture provided as well. And at the end, I'll, I'll describe my new theoretical framework for the use of music therapy for children with selective mutism and talk about the implications of the framework for clinical work, including trans and multidisciplinary teamwork. OK, so the motivation for my working um, with children with selective mutism is purely from a clinical experience. So as Helen introduced me to discuss, I've been working in an inner London borough for 14 years. When I first worked here, I was sort of being referred children who were, they were very quiet in school, but parents were reporting that this wasn't the case at home. And teachers and teaching assistants were a little bit bemused as to why they weren't really sort of warming up and settling down into their nursery classes or perhaps their reception classes as well. And so they'd get referred to music therapy and perhaps for an assessment to see maybe think there's something else going on as well. And quite often the, the children would um, 
respond extremely well to music therapy and quite quickly and sort of become quite loud in the sessions, start talking in the sessions. And then I'd send them back into the classroom and the teachers and teaching assistants would say, oh yes, they're really, they're fine now and they're really noisy. What have you done, Kate? Um, so they were responding really well to, to music therapy. And so at the same time, obviously, I started to become quite curious about what, what was going on here. So I did a bit of background reading. I also attended a lecture up at, at Borough about some research that was coming out about care pathways for people with selective mutism. And at, as part of the lecture, um, at the lecture, there's Tony Klein, whose book you can see there on the left of the screen. And so I was very excited and I said to Tony, I said, oh, you know, music therapy is very exciting with children with of selective mutism and he said to me so oh, well Kate you know that I can really believe that I can understand why that would be the case but you need to go away and do some research so that's what I did and I initially did a single case study as part of my MA research and then I decided I really needed to, to look at this further and so I undertook a PhD so my next slide, I'm, I'm, next few slides, I'm going to discuss what is and what isn't selective mutism. So the next slide I apologise for, and I will whip on over it quite quickly, but it's just to demonstrate a point about selective mutism. Okay. Calm blue slide now. So this is just to demonstrate the point that selective mutism is considered to be an anxiety disorder and um, quite closely linked to phobias and um, say phobias of spiders and other things like that so um, it used to be described as a, um, a disorder of early childhood but it's more recently been reclassified in um, the diagnostic and statistical manual in 2013 as an anxiety disorder um, sometimes people refer to it as speech anxiety um, it quite commonly runs in families so if you're working with a child you'll quite often find that one or other of the parents has also had selective mutism or they'll say that mm, yes I was I didn't speak at school um, it's an extremely debilitating disorder if it's not treated early and children and adolescents can be become very isolated if they have selective mutism children will present with a very sort of frozen um, physically frozen and very sort of flat affect um, sometimes not not moving at all and at school, children will also have problems um, going to the toilet and with eating as well. And obviously alongside that, there are sort of safety and safeguarding issues. So some children will um, be at school all day and, and will break an arm and not report it until they get home and see their parent. So I've heard that story a few times. And obviously there could be safeguarding issues that children aren't discussing or reporting. And to younger children, it can feel very physical. It can feel like a constriction in the throat. It's more common in girls and boys, about two thirds to a third, which is different to other communication disorders. And it becomes entrenched if it's not treated early on. So that's why early intervention is really important. But intervention at any stage is important and it, it is treatable. If it continues too long, it can result in poor mental health, for example, generalised anxiety and social phobia, and poor educational outcomes, low em employment opportunities and social impairment. And people with selective mutism often report that they've been bullied in school. And they've obviously not been able to talk, discuss it. There's lots of myths around selective mutism. Um, it's not due to abuse or trauma so obviously you always have to look out for abuse in in all children but there's they're no more likely to have experienced abuse than other children and it's very different from traumatic um, mutism that's a different disorder entirely so with traumatic mutism a person will stop talking in all settings so selective mutism they're talking at school and um, at home and not at school so it's quite specific it's not just shyness there's a myth that children are just shy when they've got selective mutism but actually quite often they're the opposite they're actually um, have very sort of boisterous personalities it's not oppositional or manipulative or controlling or stubbornness 
it's not a choice so children aren't choosing not to speak they're often absolutely desperate to speak but they feel like they can't because it feels like a physical constriction in the throat due to the anxiety it's actually the vocal folds in the in the throat tightening up and it's not a form of autism although they can go together they're two different two separate things but you can see them both at the same time and there's generally quite a lot of poor awareness and misconceptions about selective mutism. So this is the dictionary definition of selective mutism from DSM-5. Um, so it's consistent failure to speak in specific social situations at which there's an expectation for speaking, so in school or, or other situations, but most commonly you sit in school. The disturbance interferes with educational or occupational achievement or with social communication. And it should be lasting for about a, a month before it's diagnosed. The failure to speak is not due to lack of knowledge of the, the language. And it's not better accounted for by, by something else, a communication order, for example. So on this slide, I've compared the prevalence with autism. And obviously, they're entirely different disorders. Um, autism is lifelong and um, selective mutism is treatable. But just to have a look at the statistics, it's, it's quite useful. So autism um, in the US recently, um, sort of seen at about 1.4%. In Cambridge a few years ago, 1.57%. Um, selective mutism, there haven't been any great prevalence studies. So these are accumulated statistics from a range of different studies. But our best guess currently is that, is that it's around 0.7%. Some say as high as 1.9%. Um, but this rises, through, it triples in children who are learning a second language. Um, and obviously this is a big issue and it's not due to their lack of knowledge of that language. So quite a lot of children who are referred for treatment are speaking English well at home. Um, so there's something else going on here that's um, preventing them speaking at school. Okay, so the therapeutic landscape, and this is really part of the liter literature review part of my um, PhD, the therapeutic landscape for people with selective mutism. Can you hear that? Not now, that's finished, sorry. So um, just while we're pausing, um, I'm sure Kate will be back. Uh, I think she's just trying to um, get the environment a bit quieter where she is. Um, if you do have questions to ask, um, there's a, something at the bottom of your screen that should say Q&A and you can pose your question there. Hopefully we'll be able to ask it for you. I'm, I'm sorry we can't all speak, we've got over 150 of you here and welcome from uh, some of you all over the world uh, so it's very exciting um, but if you start with your questions of course um, you might want to wait a little bit longer but you're welcome to put them I think it will work right now I think it's open and Ah, so people are putting questions in the chat as well. Um, I'll try and look at both when we come to the question section. Um, and if you use the bit that says Q&A, that will be uh, even better. I think I'd like Kate to answer that question someone's asked already. Um, about learning a second language and um, does it mean using English as a second language and I think Kate will want to expand on that because she's um, working in quite a multicultural 
um, group of settings. Oh, so she's ready to go. Welcome back. Hi, so I'm a pilot. Sorry about that. My mum called me and it came onto my computer. <laughs> so there's a link in there. I had to tell her to stop calling me. Okay, so we're looking at the therapeutic landscape. Um, so the main interventions for, um, for selective mutism across the UK are sort of a behavioural approach, which are sort of commonly seen um, used by speech and language therapists using the selective mutism resource manual, which is a resource that I would really recommend that anybody buys who, who are working with children with selective mutism. And this, a similar approach will be used within CAMS, um, who will also sort of have a more of a psychotherapeutic approach, but will borrow a lot of elements from CBT and behavioural therapy. Within the US, and this is one of the reasons that I wanted to um, actually undertake some of the research, the U um, US are sort of prescribing low dose um, fluoxetines or Prozacs for, for young children with selective mutism um, and quite often this is you know with, with good intention obviously to reduce the anxiety and enable children to speak and it does you know it has some some effect but obviously um, the parents and children would prefer um, other interventions for selective mutism and play and drama and music therapy has been written about to some extent but not hugely researched at this stage and so really we sort of can see quite a multimodal approach to um, selective mutism currently but with yes not a lot of um, research undertaken at this point there has been a small pilot trial of um, the selective mutism resource manual showing good success there but that's about it and within the UK SMIRA is our um, UK charity for selective mutism for, so for any further information you should check out their website um, and they will also send you to give you information about other courses that are available. Okay, so the, for this PhD study, my main question was, does a theoretical framework developed in single case study research explain the process of music therapy across a number of cases of children with selective mutism? So this is the initial framework that I came up with after a single case study. Um, and I'm not going to go into this in a huge depth. I might just leave it there for, for a few seconds. But really, it's it's quite um, this is a quite a pared down version of that that case study, and it's just showing the different elements that um, children respond to or use within the music therapy sessions um, when they have selective mutism. Okay, I'm going to move on. Okay, so for the um, PhD study, I had a number of stages. Um, so I had lots of different questions I addressed in slightly different ways. So um, initially I was wondering, well, do we need this research into music therapy? Perhaps there are other interventions that are very effective. And so I did a, a review of, of interventions for selective mutism. I then had a, a, a thorough investigation of music therapy literature to find any, any literature that described um, music therapy as an intervention for both children and adults with selective mutism. And then I was considering whether anybody else in the UK thought perhaps they had, but was using music therapy as an intervention for selective mutism. And so I undertook a survey. And after the survey, I felt that I really wanted to investigate a bit deeper um, the experiences of, of those music therapists and, and so I, I undertook six interviews with those music therapists. And then prior to, to doing the case studies, um, I interviewed six different professionals within the borough. Um, so that was a range of speech and language therapists and um, educational psychologists and CAMS professionals, just to think about the care pathways within the borough. And then I undertook six case studies. Um, 
of, of music therapy for children with selective mutism. So I'm just going to dip into the first few sections of the PhD without giving you too much detail because there's not time this evening, but I'm, I'm actually hoping to publish quite a few different stages of the research. So for this selective mutism and music therapy literature, there wasn't a huge amount written about in um, the databases that I initially searched. And so I took a different approach to the literature review for that. So I hand sorted music therapy journals back to 1970 and I did Google searching for grey literature and then from any literature that popped up I did reference list checking and from this I was quite excited I found 17 different studies and these were 18 peer-reviewed papers, um, five book chapters, a conference paper and three theses and there were 14 clinical case reports and three case study research. And these six studies, the six studies reported emotional improvements without speech, three reported speech in therapy sessions, and eight reported generalised speech, which I was quite, ex I was quite excited about this, uh, this literature. And so when I analysed it thematically, I was looking at some of the um, different aspects that came up and they started to really resonate with, with some of my experience already. So you can see things like, um, loud playing and all instruments um, that were common to a lot, much of these reports um, and things like humor and laughter um, were also popping up as, as being important in the in the therapy process and i'll just let you have a little, little look at that there okay and then moving on to the survey um, the main questions really for the survey was just to ask if music therapy had been used as an intervention for selective mutism in the UK and for whom um, and what was music therapist's experience of this and how is it being used and what are the different techniques and approaches and how does the music therapy process reflect the theoretical framework that's under scrutiny here and what was the impact of the therapy so the survey was sent out to 835 BAMPT members, so BAMPT is the British Association of Music Therapy, and 75 people responded. And people were only asked to respond if they had some experience of working with um, children or adults with selective mutism. I'm just going to give you a few little snippets from the survey. Okay. So mainly it showed that um, most music therapists had, had worked with like one child um, with, with uh, selective mutism. That was the most sort of common um, type of working um, presentation. Some, some people had worked with adolescents and a few with adults. Um, but just to give an overview of the survey, some of the main results were that it was mainly individual work in schools. Um, and again, oral instruments and larger percussion appear to be really important in a lot of this work. And people reported that musical conversations and anxiety reduction were key features of the therapy. But there was broad agreement that music therapy has a positive effect with speaking in all settings shown as the main effect in the two to seven year old age range. So after this, I then did six interviews um, with music therapists and I tried to interview music therapists that had a reasonable amount of experience um, working with either children or adults with, with selective mutism. So I was really building on the survey data and drilling for more detail and depth. And I, had, I did semi-structured interviews exploring three main areas. So just a bit about the therapist's background and experience. And then I really wanted to get full detailed case narratives from them, including their approach, their techniques and outcomes. And also then to really ask them some questions that were connected to the theoretical framework and then actually show them the theoretical framework and ask for a direct comment on it. And so the, the data from the interview really show that there were sort of two broad thematic areas and one was really about music therapists understandings of, of selective mutism 
And the second thematic area was about specifically about the music therapy for selective mutism, which broke down fairly neatly into two different areas again. So thinking about therapeutic thinking and then the musical thinking. So I'm just going to leave these slides up here without going into too much detail. So although there were some knowledge gaps when I interviewed the um, music therapist, there was also quite a strong feeling of intuitive understanding as well about um, selective mutism and how to work with it. And the other thematic area, there's a really strong sense of the value of music therapy for, for children and also adults with, with selective mutism. That was something that came across extremely strongly. Um, and there was discussion about the different musical or structures or, or versus improvisation and freedom in the music. Um, and then in terms of the therapy, a lot of discussion about different techniques used and aims and approaches. So I'm really skimming over the, um, the survey and the interviews to get to this, which is the mul multiple case study research. So multiple case studies are an opportunity for an in-depth examination of how and why music therapy is helpful for selective mutism. And Yin says that explanatory multiple case studies allow for theory to be developed and key elements of an intervention that appear to have significant potential for a particular clinical need to be thoroughly explored and analysed as to their relevance and utility. And to analyse it, I use template analysis. So essentially using my initial framework, which I showed you, as a tool, as a comparison tool across the different multiple cases. So the primary research question was, does a theoretical framework developed in single case study research explain the process of music therapy across a number of children with selective mutism? And the secondary question was, what are the main ingredients in music therapy that appear useful for children with selective mutism? And how do the therapy narratives from multiple case studies enrich or challenge the theoretical framework? And then some sub questions as well. What's the chain of evidence that demonstrates those key elements and narrative in each case? And are those elements the same or similar across different cases? And how do these elements fit on the theoretical framework? And are there any other factors missing from the framework that are important for the success or failure of the therapy? So this was school-based therapy. And I, I worked with children who were of nursery or reception age children. So that was from between three to five years of age who had selective mutism in a, in a London borough. So these were children both with and without English as an additional language. As, as I didn't really believe that having um, English as an additional language was, affects the selective mutism in itself. Um, and th these were all children who I would say had straightforward selective mutism. They didn't have other things going on at the same time, such as um, a recent bereavement or some emotional work that, that needed to be done. So it's, we were mainly thinking about the selective mutism itself. And the recruitment was through the SENCO network in the borough. So SENCOs are special educational um, needs coordinators. So they work with all the children in, in the schools that have any, any special educational needs. And so um, I presented, um, I gave a presentation to all the SENCOs about selective mutism, and then asked them to refer children into the research project and checked whether they met the criteria for the project. And then I had school-based meetings with the SENCOs, sorry about acronyms again, and then I observed the children within the school. I also undertook, um, I gave staff and parents information about selective mutism and the general approach to selective mutism, which is really, really important to get a sort of no pressure approach in place. And then I undertook parental interviews following the outline in the Selective Mutism Resource Manual. 
So that's really asking background questions to the parents about their lives, um, any sort of cultural aspects of, of speech, um, and where their, the children's speech sort of starts and finishes and try, drawing a little map of, of their speech. I then undertook a pilot case study to test the methods and procedures and all the children were offered two music therapy assessment sessions to see if really they were um, responding positively to, to music therapy or I felt that they, they potentially would respond positively. And then they were offered weekly individual sessions and these were term time only for a naturalistic amount of time. So I'll just explain what I mean by naturalistic. So they were offered music therapy until such time that I felt they'd regained the optimum amount of ben benefit from it. So whether that be emotionally or hopefully be speech as well. Okay, so to analyze the data, there's a few different stages. This, the initial stage was a real inductive, holistic engagement in the data of each case. So immersion in the data. So reading a research diary. Um, so the research diary I kept in the beginning of the process through, through to the end. Reading the research diary, the clinical notes, watching the videos. And then starting the, the analysis then with some open coding of all the clinical notes um, and clustering the codes to create categories and producing a map of themes that connecting the, the categories. So that was really sort of Bourne and Clark um, thematic analysis. But I wanted to um, analyze the data from the whole of the cases rather than sort of selecting bits and then analyzing those sections. I then did some narrative analysis. So this is analytic data reduction and distillation. So I did this by writing summaries of, of the narratives and creating data displays of the therapeutic narrative until we're really sort of sifting it down to the key elements of, of those cases and showing how a child got from A to B in their, in, their, in their process. And then choosing the evidence of the case, so selecting and transcribing meaningful moments from the video that highlights and really evidences this case narrative. So you can say, this happened, then this happened. And you, can, you can see the, the sequence of events there. And these um, meaningful moments were mined then for further insight or themes. And then the template analysis was really sort of placing the themes and overarching thematic areas on and around the theoretical framework. And then noting how the, the themes link to or, or didn't fit on the theoretical framework and identifying and describing any potential modifications to the theoretical framework. Okay, so just, just uh, an overview of the different children that I saw for the multiple case studies. As you'll see um, in column, I think it is column six, they, um, the first five children that I saw all had English as an additional language and, and somebody Anglia Ruskin pointed this out to me um, and I think I'd got um, because I don't really see having English as an additional language as something that particularly affects the selective mutism itself um, I'd, I'd just accept them into the research project so then at the end I decided quite deliberately to, to um, ask for somebody to be referred who didn't have English as an additional language just because I felt like I needed to sort of prove prove my point a little bit. Okay so I'm just going to go back to the previous slide so you can see. So Tasha um, I'm going to talk about now. Um, so she was somebody who'd had 48 sessions of music therapy um, and alongside Pilar um, they were sort of two of the most complex um, complex cases so there's a lot of rich rich data really from from these um, therapy narratives so Tasha's family were from the Congo and she spoke English and Lingala but her speech stopped outside of her house so it's literally at her front door um, she had four siblings and at the time that I was working with her she was homeless and living in temporary accommodation in, in a very overcrowded hostel. She was four years old and she was attending nursery school. 
at the parental interview, I had an interpreter there um, and mum had to turn up with, with all the siblings. Um, so we're in this really big room together and Tasha managed to find a ukulele and she was sort of sneaking little glances at me and, and playing the ukulele. And actually, as put in the interview, she did sort of whisper to mum in front of me, which was, which was quite interesting. So for Tasha, she had very sort of um, good initial musical engagement and actually started singing and speaking. But then as we went on, there was some quite serious challenges in, in this sort of therapy process, um, which I will describe. But I'm now going to share some case material from those initial cases so you can see that early path into speech. So this is just a map of the themes from um, Tasha's uh, therapy process. Um, so, you know, she had a lot of challenges outside of, of her therapy sessions. She had you know, homelessness, po poverty, quite under-resourced school. Um, all sorts of things were going on for her. Um, and so, yes, yeah, so you really need to think about the context. And this will come up when I show you the um, final theoretical framework from, from the research. Okay, so this is the revised theoretical framework and you can see it's got a similar kind of shape to the original one. I'm just going to get the laser pointer here, so hopefully you'll be able to see this. So there's two key additions to the structure of the framework. So at the beginning here you can see this new column, which is the pre-therapy that comes before you would even start the therapeutic process, music therapy process for the child with selective mutism. So before then, you really need to um, get some education and training in selective mutism and good understanding of, of the disorder before you start working with a child with selective mutism. Um, and so there are various different components of this as well. So having an open and flexible approach to um, working with a child with selective mutism and blending in other techniques, possibly speech and language th therapy techniques as part of the assessment process. Um, and borrowing many of these resources pre starting the, the actual therapy um, treatment itself. It's really important to um, create a supportive team around the child um, and create a no pressure approach. Um, and just to go across the bottom here, you can see there's a new row um, called context. Um, so this is everything that's sort of going on outside of the um, therapy sessions. So there's there, which is sort of hugely impacts the, the therapy itself. Um, the two cases that were much longer and more complex um, had quite challenging sort of school environments around them. So I think it's very important that we work within that context as well, um, because this yeah, impacts the therapy. But really the, the music therapy itself, although this is slightly reshaped from the initial framework and has a, a lot more depth and detail, um, we have a huge amount of resources um, as music therapists to work with these client groups. And it, this just came across really strongly in the, um, in the case studies. And we had six successful um, case studies. All the children spoke. Um, and speech was generalised back into third classrooms and other contexts. So it was a really successful study. Um, just going through now some implications for practice. Um, I've just said we've had six successful case studies demonstrating how the core ingredients of music therapy are very helpful for children with selective mutism. So again, all instruments and things like microphones, which help really empower and exaggerate the voice are really, really helpful. Using laughter as well um, really helps to sort of warm up the voice and relaxes a person and re releases anxiety as well. So it's got a sort of a dual role. Um, and within the sessions, children warm up slowly into speech and we quite often use dramatic play and playfulness and also the anxiety and isolation associated with selective mutism is really transformed through the therapeutic relationship, which is something very specific to, to music therapy as well. So all of these things are really enhanced with improved knowledge and understanding of selective mutism. 
and with engaging with the team and creating a supportive environment around each child. And also having a really a, a flexible approach to session length was absolutely key as well. So sometimes extending sessions, which is um, you know, a little bit different perhaps to some of our music therapy practice and perhaps also increasing the, the frequency of sessions if possible. Um, and the generalization of speech to all contexts is a really key part of treatment, which we must never, never neglect. So I'm probably getting quite close to finishing there, Helen. Um, I'm just gonna say about further research that I'd like to under undertake now. Um, I'd like to collaborate a lot more with speech and language therapy and educational psychology to explore the place of music therapy on care pathways for selective mutism and also develop a selective mutism and music therapy manual that we can then pilot and test and revise um, and as part of any further research I'd like to do a prevalence study because it's it's so badly needed. Okay I've probably gone over time so I'm going to finish there and, and uh, ask questions. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kate. Um, there are lots of questions, um, but thank you. It's the sliding in um, concept that I think music therapists naturally might um, be doing is, is, is coined in this work that you've described. I think that's another outcome. There are several outcomes of things that you've, caught, you've found out and you've named, mm. um, which I think are really important. That always is one that has impressed me, but um, I think you've just answered. We've got quite a lot of questions, so if you don't mind, I'll just zoom in <laughs> to the questions. Fine, go ahead. Um, so one of them was about what were your plans for future research? So thank you for that question, and I think you've just answered that. Mm. Um, there's a group around, unsurprisingly, um, the pandemic, and one of them is just about hygiene and is about um, using of um, wind instruments and some of the instruments you're using and um, a practical question about what's happening mm -hmm. now. Yeah. And there's a much broader question um, asked by John Strange, which is um, that you've demonstrated short and long term therapy that is quite intense happening weekly and um, Owing to the pandemic, would there be, in your view, um, a risk of budgets being cut? And therefore, is there any mileage in a quick fix where uh, maybe music therapy could help in a much quicker way? I paraphrase the question. So yeah. I'm gonna, I can come back. But. Um, yes, so if I I'll maybe answer the question about oral um, instruments. So one, one little idea that I'll actually shared, I'll share from a, from a colleague was just actually to have um, instruments specific for one child. So a cheap selection of, of instruments that you clean, but then you put in a plastic bag and they're for that particular child. Um, and things like kazoos are very inexpensive. Um, so that's, that's one way around it if you, if you do want to con continue using oral instruments <laughs> in the pandemic. Um, and is that John Strange question, can you just remind me of that? Well, he's really um, predicting that maybe at the moment budgets might be cut and if they were cut for this type of work that, um, although you did demonstrate in your cases short and long term work, but did you think there were any quick shortcut ways of working that could be quite helpful in this moment if there wasn't funding to do work over a much longer period of time? Yes, I mean, I think we probably could do transdisciplinary work at quite an early stage and actually share share working practices with other co colleagues, possibly should be, you know, working very closely yeah. with other, other staff in nurseries um, and giving them some ideas of how to play with children using, using music that might really help as well. Yeah. So thank you. There's some questions as well around quite specific to the child that uh, some of the children that you presented and um, maybe I could say that there could be a chance to follow up with some questions um, because Kate's you've got Kate's details I think and if not we'll put them up um, and that we'll also make the slides available but there is a general um, couple of questions about the effect of breaks which you did talk about with one child breaks in the therapy and would you work 
with parents in between and you know or would you train other people you just talked about working with nursery staff but what's your view sort of if there's a break coming up about that boundary and that relationship with the therapist and the yeah. effect of that yeah no that's, that that's a really time. good question thank you um that is something that came out of the data as well that i haven't really gone into in the presentation that um actually breaks can be sometimes helpful um and one way of working with children with selective mutism is actually to work sometimes in their home um or to work in other environments to to support their speech confidence and there's also plenty of resources as well to um encourage parents to support their children over those breaks as well so um, encouraging brave talking and things throughout holiday periods so there is there is plenty of work that can be done but yes I think that um, it is important to think about why why we have boundaries in place and when it can be useful to sort of therapeutically um, change that in order to to support the child yeah thank you there's so many questions um, coming up and some of them are about again the origins of selective mutism so you made it very clear i think um the parameters within which you are understanding selective mutism but there's some questions about um from someone thinking that maybe tasha's mutism might have been slightly induced by trauma and experiences in in the hostile environment um, and another comment about is is it just linked to confidence and familiarity which comes within a trusting relationship so maybe that's something you could comment on in general mm. i mean i, th I think with, with trauma um you know obviously there are degrees of trauma and sort of adverse childhood experiences um of which men, you know, a lot of us have, have one or two. Um, and so I think um, because there has been an association of sort of mutism with trauma, we tend to, tend to look for it. And obviously when we're working with, with anyone or any child, we take a case history and you'd note all those, all those events. Um, and so they may well have affected, affected a child's well-being. But I think um, making that specific link too much isn't, isn't necessarily helpful. Um, but sometimes there has been something um, negative that might have happened to a child that's associated with speaking um, so they might have gone into school and because perhaps they've got a different accent than other children in the school and um, they've had a slightly negative response and then that's created anxiety that's been associated with anxiety about speech so normally it's very sort of linked with the, the speech itself yeah thank you um, I think we've got time for one or two more because uh, there's an important one here about uh, you probably answered it in a way you've talked about lots of multidisciplinary input but there's a specific question about someone who stopped speaking across the board so this is from a music therapist um, and who's working with someone who's who stopped speaking across the board and reduced to just a very few repeated short phrases and um, now stopping altogether speaking and although the speech and language therapist is getting involved is, is there anyone else that you would suggest and I suppose you have just been talking about um, parents teachers getting involved but is there any comment Kate you wanted to make about that if, if selective mutism has become um, more global um, it's that that's called progressive mutism so selective mutism can turn into progressive mutism and it's really important to um you might actually want to get some supervision from from somebody such as um maggie johnson who wrote wrote the manual who's an expert in you know when things go too far like that it needs to be a very good sort of team team approach really um, so yeah, it becomes much more tricky when it turns into um, progressive mutism, but always we need to be thinking about reducing anxiety um, as the main sort of culprit in, in, in exacerbating the mutism. So that would be the angle I would take really thinking about any ways of, of um, reducing anxiety. I know I'm bombarding you with questions, Kate, but obviously your, your talks elicited many and some, some are along the theme of the research aspect yeah 
Um, and one is, uh, of course, you know, at Anglia Ruskin University, we, we have master's courses in drama therapy and music therapy. And um, welcome to all our master's and PhD students here. Um, and there is a question here, which is, has there been much research in drama therapy um, for this population? Yeah, I've, I've read one, one case report. Um, so I'm not aware of a huge amount of research in this area, but it would be really interesting um, to do some because I actually found that I was using quite dramatic um, play within my uh, the music therapy sessions as well. So especially with young children, obviously there's a, there's a component which it might be really useful and also exploring diff just different ways of being, different aspects of, you know, potential personality and bringing those into um, sessions in different ways. And I also use, you know, puppets as well are very, very useful. So definitely, I mean, yeah, if anyone's interested in doing some drama therapy research, that'd be, that'd be fabulous. And there's also a question about, I mean, doing survey research, and I suppose presenting research, we often hear, as you've presented, the really important findings. And someone is interested in, through the BAMP survey, were there any negative results from people working um, with this population? Were there any times, you know, when things haven't worked out in the ways that um, your six cases did? Can you comment on that? I think there was one person who said that maybe um, actually working um, using music therapy made their, their client more, more anxious. So obviously, always when we use any intervention, you have to do some assess assessment sessions to see if um, you feel like it's going to be an appropriate intervention for that person. So I think that's probably the point when you might screen out music therapy. But other than that, it was, it was a very sort of positive um, response within the survey results. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think we've just got time for one more, um, which is coming from your clinical examples. Um, I think you mentioned a toy. I, I couldn't hear quite whether it was a kazoo or not, but somebody's asked about what was the toy instrument you were using. Mm -hmm. No, it was actually a toy karaoke machine. Oh, I think okay. they're quite small and... Um, yeah. I was working across a different school, so different schools. So I was after sort of quite small scale kit, oh. um, and it, but it was great because it also had a harmonisation feature, and so it was quite appealing to to use. Um, so it really appealed to Tasha. Oh yes, that must have been what she meant. Yeah, sorry. Or her. Uh, I think we've probably come to the end. Sarah, do you, do you want to comment or ask any questions that I've missed? Um, bearing in mind the time. I know you've got some things to say. Yeah, I think we were suggesting that maybe if people had other questions, they might be able to contact the email address that will be given out in the survey afterwards as well, um, if there are any more. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, just a couple of reminders. Thank you very much, Kate. Uh, it was a great presentation. Um, and just, yeah, a couple of reminders. One, that there will there'll be a survey that will be sent out at the end. Um, and if people could fill this in, it would be great. It helps to kind of improve our webinars and have different topics that people are interested in and all sorts. Um, so that would be great if you could fill it out. And the other reminder is that our next webinar will be on Monday, the 2nd of November, um, at the same time, so 5.30 to 6.30. And again, you'll have a reminder and an email and things, but Dr. Wendy McGee will be presenting music as a mechanism of change in disorders of consciousness. How and why does music work? Um, so you'll be sent more information on this and the link to register from SIMTA in the couple of weeks before the webinar. Uh, and hope to see you all then. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you to the SIMTA team who've been involved in arranging, especially the technical side of it, which is beyond me and but really seems to be working okay. We like feedback about that as well. Um, and when Sarah said it, it'll be, I think it appears, I think the survey appears as you leave the meeting. Is that right? Just it's either the day what? after or ah. as soon as you leave the meeting. Oh, okay, remember. thank you. Yes. Yeah. Thank you so much. So Kate, thank you again so much um, for really thank stimulating. So no, thank you for, for allowing me to, to present. It's been really wonderful, really wonderful opportunity. Um,
and uh, yes, really nice to raise awareness of, of selective mutism wherever possible. Thank you all. Apologies for running over, but we've still got 112 people here, I can see, so that, that, that's only good. Um, and we'll see you next time. Stay safe, everyone. Bye. Bye.